All right. And to see if we are live and rolling. Are we the right portrait? Are we landscape? We're still landscape. We're good. All right, let's go. We are on and live. <laughs> Y'all stand and let's worship the Lord together. Doing a little bit of old and a little bit of new tonight.
heard it this week on the radio and I love the word.
your side. Lord, I know without a doubt that you saved me by your amazing grace, God. And I can't wait till you take me by my hand, God. Leading me, leading me through that promised land that you so have promised us. If we know you and if we serve you, that we are going to one day be with you. Hallelujah, God. I thank you for your presence that we feel in this very room tonight. Then, God, I want you to continue to use Pastor David as he preaches the word you have given him tonight. And, Lord, those who are watching online right now, I want your spirit to just be evident in their room where they're watching, in their car, whatever they are watching on. Let your presence, God, your mighty Holy Spirit be evident right now in the name of Jesus. If you need to touch someone, if you need to heal their body, God, if you need to touch their mind, their spirit, that they may have been down. And Lord, right now you are lifting them up. And God, you are touching them and you are reminding them that you are God and you are in charge of everything that is going on in our lives. You are in charge of everything that is going on in this world. You have not forsaken us, God. It may seem sometimes like you have, but God, I'm holding to your nail-scarred hand tonight. And I want you to lead me and guide me every step of the way that I make each and every day. Wake me up in the morning. Show me the path that I need to take that day. And God, let me follow in your footsteps. God, I love you. And God, I praise you. In your mighty name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You ready to bring the word of God? Woo. That was a workout. Hallelujah. We got the spirit is moving from that first beat of the bass guitar that shot you through the roof tonight. Praise the Lord. Listen, it's a day that we are looking forward to. We got to keep focused. And that is the message, I believe, from the Holy Spirit tonight that's already been uh, through the words and lyrics of the songs that we've been singing that we don't look to anything in this world. This world is just a temporary dwelling for the children of God. And the more we remember that there is coming a day that when no sorrow, everything is going to be fine. We are going to be gathered up. We are just journeying through this world. And the Lord is in control. And even if it doesn't seem like it sometimes, that's the enemy coming and bringing doubt in our lives and bringing fear and worry. And uh, I so appreciated the message last week from my wife uh, in combating the enemy. And I found that after that and after we beat up on the devil, he came after us again this week. And that's kind of what he does. He says, oh, you think you're tough? You think you're tough? And we are tough. We're tough in the Lord. We are strong in the Lord. It is the joy of the Lord that is our strength and our help and our ever-present help in time of trouble. And we need not fear anything in this world. We need not fear anything about what's going on in our society because God is in control. And uh, if he says things are going to get better, things are going to get better. If they, he says things are going to get worse, they're going to get worse. But it doesn't matter. His love for us is the same whether we go through trials, whether we go through tribulations, because, again, these are temporary circumstances. And we're going to look about being content tonight. I, I remembered this week a fav famous or one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite pastors, preachers, Charles Crabtree, who's uh, suffering right now and needs prayer uh, for cancer. And uh, he, I, I loved it when he said, when you're, when you're hanging on by a thread, make sure it's the hem of his garment. <laughs> Say amen. <laughs> Say amen louder so you can cover up my cry. <laughs> I don't want the big ugly, but it's so true. You've got to hang on to him through the trouble when you feel like your hope is gone, it's not. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. Just hang on tight because our hope is secure. Our salvation is secure 
No weapon formed against us will prosper. We're going to be okay because the Lord already said it. He already said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you, and there is coming a day when we'll take him by the hand and get to see him face to face, and I can't wait. I can't wait. Looking forward to that. In Philippians chapter 4, we're talking about contentment tonight, and it's, uh, uh, it's a wonderful challenge to learn to be content. As Paul says, in all circumstances, chapter 4 of Philippians, Next week, we will have communion together. We ordered COVID-19 friendly communion cups, so everyone will have their own, and um, we'll make announcements about that, too. You at home want to join us, but in Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 11, it says, I am not saying this because, well, let's start at 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Paul is writing to his dear Philippian church and uh, from prison, from prison, after being beaten, assaulted, shipwrecked, uh, whipped, thrown in prison, out of prison, uh, Paul wasn't having a good time of it. And uh, Paul, in his situation, had gone from the height of leadership in the Jewish community to now writing this from prison, completely dependent on the Lord for provision for everything, and wasn't even able to go out and make tents right now to earn any income. So it's kind of a situation not unlike we are going through right now, but it seems much worse. But he says... You have renewed your, op your concern for me. They had sent an offering to him. And he said, I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Here's the secret. I can do all things. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, we quote that a lot. We quote that a lot like we can get through some situations in our lives. We can get through some circumstances. But Paul is relating it to the secret of being content. The secret he found was to not focus on circumstances, to not dwell on circumstances, but know that in Christ, everything is going to be okay. He can do all things through Christ. Now, he's not content with sin, not content with sin in his life. Turn back to chapter 2, uh, verse, starting with verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God, that doesn't sound content, because we have to be guarding our salvation. We have to be guarding against sin, resisting the enemy's temptation, praying every day, Lord, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. That's working it out, working out our salvation. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Uh-oh. Do everything without complaining and or arguing. This is key to contentment. No complaining, no arguing. The children of Israel, as soon as they're led out of Egypt, they begin complaining and arguing. They saw God's wonderful uh, miracle in their life, but they hadn't learned to be content because they complained, they argued. Verse 15, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. How many know we're there? A crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. We don't hold out a banner of complaints. We don't hold out a banner of arguments. We hold out the word of life and then we are 
uh, found blameless and pure in this depraved generation. Too many times we want to go the other direction. We want to go to the complaining and the arguing about the situation this world is in, the situation our nation is in. That's not what it says. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing. Shine the light. You shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Now, the circumstances Paul realizes and he encourages us, they're not the final answer. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. We talked about a month ago about keeping our eye on the prize. This world, as beautiful as it is and as wonderful as we are blessed, and it may not seem that we're very blessed, but comparatively, we are extremely blessed. And um, that, But this world, as great as it is, is not the goal. It is not the, the, the final answer. Our circumstances are going to change. Look at chapter 3 of Philippians. I love this. You've got to read this every day, starting with verse 17. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, and they're more worried about what they're going to eat. Look at Their God is their stomachs, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Verse 20, say it with me. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Looking forward to that, huh? Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. So, we have to remind ourselves again that we are not part of this world. We are citizens somewhere else, and that will keep us content in worsening situations, worsening circumstances. Some of us may face, like Charles Crabtree right now, a cancer situation. We're going to have to go through that and keep our eyes on Jesus and keep our hand on the hem of his garment, right? But... Um, you know, I, one thing, I just love South Florida, and South Florida is always so beautiful and so uh, green and lush and beautiful flowers, and, but what it, it, what it has in all of that beauty, it lacks in good produce. I miss my Midwest produce. I miss being able to plant a garden at the beginning of the summer, and then there's nothing in this world like a homegrown tomato. You cannot buy at Publix or anywhere else a homegrown tomato. They're orange when they're supposed to be red, and they're uh, bitter instead of sweet. I just loved it when we got to do that. And, um, you know, it, it's great in the spring. It was great in the spring because... We would just go to the nursery and buy plants already already growing. I, I went into the burpee seed packets and growing my own in the windowsill in January and all that. We'd go to the nursery. We'd buy, buy geraniums already in bloom. We'd buy uh, tomato plants with the little yellow flowers or little tomatoes already on them. We'd bring them home, and it was instant gratification, instant beautification. You spent a couple hours in the garden, and you, um, you uh, had uh, a beautiful flower arrangement by the end of the day. And I remember I just enjoyed so much certain things about the Midwest when it came to that, that uh, when we owned our house in Michigan, the people before us had brilliantly designed the garden to where in every season or in every month there was a different thing blooming. There was something that would bloom in March and then in... April, and then May, and then so on and so forth, until it all comes to an end. And then you feel that winter chill, and Darren loves it 
and I'm so happy for him, but it was very depressing when you start to see the colors change in late July, <laughs> and you're going, why are the trees already changing colors? It's only July, and that, that kind of hopelessness comes in. That thing that you had in spring is gone because it's kind of like, uh, we got to wait now a whole six, eight, 12 months <laughs> for this great season to happen again. But the thing that I always wanted to do, and one of the hardest things for a gardener to do, is to go when it's cold in October, when it's time to plant your spring bulbs, right? You plant them at the end of the season with the hope and the plan that we're going to get to see them in March or April come up. So it was, it was drudgery because it's like I'm cold, I'm digging in snowy soil to put these bulbs for my daffodils, or I always made sure that I had my bleeding hearts that came. You can't grow a bleeding heart here, that's for sure. But we have a lot. We have a lot of bleeding hearts, right? But, you know, it was, it w but if you really wanted to be satisfied in the spring, you had to put in the work in the fall, and then you had to let everything just die. And you get to the first blizzard, and it's three feet of snow, and the trees are iced over, and you look where you planted your bulbs and say, surely they're dead, they can't grow after this. But God beautifully designed those bulbs that they need that cold ground. They need that cold ground to go through to give us hope that the spring season was coming again and the beauty that's coming again. God has put in us, planted in us, that hopeful bulb for the season that's coming. We may be right now facing the winter time, facing the hopelessness, facing the idea that things are getting dreary, things are getting colder, things are uh, covering over with, there's no green left anywhere. It's covered with snow and gloom. But the hope we have that is planted in us is what God has done for all of us to help us remember that we are going to make it through. We are going to get there because just like spring comes every year in the Midwest and the grass grows again and the trees bloom again, that's what God's plan and hope for us is. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, they, God already had a plan. He already had a promise. But the children of Israel had to go through years and years and years of waiting for the Messiah to come. And Abraham had the promise uh, put in him that he was going to be the father of many nations. And he was 80 years old already, and his wife was 80 years old, and it wasn't going to be an immaculate conception. It was going to be a natural conception. And they were like, we're 80 and they had that hope, that seed within them, that he would be the father of nations. And then the children of Israel were brought into the promised land. And then they had this glorious kingdom that David built and Solomon built. And God had promised that to them. But he said, I'm not done with them. There is going to be a, someone from the line of David that I'm going to create a new covenant with you. Yes, you had a promise of a kingdom that I established in this world, but now you have a promise of a kingdom established in another world. I love this, uh, this account of events in Jeremiah chapter 32. Turn in Jeremiah chapter 32. God instructs Jeremiah to buy a field. Now, just to set this up a little bit, the country, the nation of Israel had already been divided, and there was, there was destruction everywhere. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he had to watch, as we are watching, our nation crumble morally. It crumbles morally first. People turn from God first, 
God withholds his blessing. He doesn't bring his judgment, but he withholds his blessing and his protection. And then the enemies come in and destroy. And that's Jeremiah was assigned the task of warning the, the people of Israel. Don't do go don't go the way you're going away from God, but come running back to God. And they refused to listen. They were stiff necked and hard headed, like a lot of people I know today. But in the midst of all this destruction, in the midst of all this, now you, you guys know real estate. Real estate is location, 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 right? You don't go into a uh, destruction zone as we've seen them burning our cities and go and say, you want to buy there, right? You want to buy in downtown Minneapolis. You want to buy in downtown Portland. You'd say, stay as clear of there as possible. God does the opposite here. Look at beginning with verse uh, 6. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle is going to come to you and say, buy my field at Anathoth, because as nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. Then just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, buy my field at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. So it is your right to redeem it and possess it, buy it for yourself. I knew this was the word of the Lord, so I bought the field, um, and we weighed out the silver. I signed and sealed the de deed, had it witnessed and weighed on, out the silver on the scales. I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions as well as the unsealed copy, and I gave the deed to Baruch, the son of uh, Nariah, the son of Mahamael, excuse me, Messiah, and in the presence of my cousin and of the witnesses who had just signed the deed and all the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the guard. Now look at this. In their presence, I gave Baruch these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Take these documents, both the sealed and unsealed copies of the deed of purchase, and put them in a clay jar so they will last a long time. Put those documents, put that purchase, put that receipt in a clay jar so they will last a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty of God of Israel says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. This was a promise for a future recovery, a future restoration for the people of Israel. Now, they never came back to the glory days of David, but it was a promise that says, and you'll see in the previous chapter, a promise of the Messiah, a promise of the new covenant. Put that in a jar because it's going to take years for you to see it come to pass. And after I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, and we know this. We used to sing this chorus. Ah, sovereign Lord, ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by your great power <coughs> and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands, but bring the punishment of the fa for the father's sins into the laps of their children after them. O oh, great and powerful God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to all the ways of men. You reward everyone according to his conduct. You perform miraculous signs in the wonders of Egypt and have continued them to this day, both in Israel and among all mankind, and gave and have gained the renown that is still yours. You brought your people Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. You gave them this land you had sworn to give their forefathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now listen. This is a message to us today that no matter what destruction we see, no matter what judgment we see come upon the face of the earth, 
There is a promise. There is coming a day when that bulb will begin to bloom again. God's promise was you will buy houses and fields and vineyards again and will be brought back to this land. There is a hope. There is a promise. And it says nothing is too hard for you, O God. Jeremiah had no evidence of say to say that. He had nothing to look at in his circumstances to say nothing is too hard for you. But what he did have was the experience of knowing that God was who he said. He created the heavens. We've talked about this over and over again. When you doubt that God has power to change your life and to make a difference, look at creation. He has the ability to speak something out of nothing and he alone holds that ability he is going to see us to the springtime to the reblooming to our reward this is not our reward this is a blessing to live paul says for me to live is good but to die is gain But if this life is so good, we have to remember that the life to come, the things he has promised, we're going to see and we get through these difficult circumstances by remembering nothing is too hard for our God. And there's plenty of evidence in my life and in my surroundings to prove that my God is able. You know, uh, it was uh, uh, Shakespeare who wrote the line, this is the winter of our discontent. And I was reminded of that as I was thinking about the bulb and about going through the winter time. We're in a time where where it feels like winter. It's a time that it just doesn't feel like it's right. And it isn't. This isn't where it ends. Look at Philippians now, again, chapter 4. And with this I close. Philippians chapter 4. We sang it tonight. Chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Remember, he's saying this from prison. He's saying this, a battered, abused man of God. If anyone should have been able to say, God, I deserve better than this, it would have been Paul. I'm serving you. I'm, I'm preaching the gospel. I'm the first one to write half of the New Testament. If anybody had a right to complain and say, yeah, I I don't really deserve this, it was Paul. But what does he say? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Say that. The Lord is near. And one we quote all the time. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. This is what he's saying. Look to me. Don't be worried. Don't fear. It's a commandment throughout Scripture. Do not be afraid. Do not be anxious. But in everything, look to me, and I will take care of it. (coughs) In thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, when we're discontent, we have no peace. When we're discontent, we have anxiety. When we're discontent, we're worried about what's going to happen. We're worried about where the next paycheck is going to come from. We're worried about how we're going to make our lives work out. But the Lord is saying, don't be in that situation Uh, Be in peace when you pray and you resist anxiety and fear. The peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Our minds need that transforming peace, but we have to focus on the Prince of Peace. We will not find peace in anything in this world. We will never find peace in a paycheck. We'll always be waiting for the next one. But the peace of God lets us know you don't even need a paycheck. Consider the lilies of the field. They don't toil or spin, yet they are adorned like Solomon. 
Do not worry about what you will eat or drink or wear. Your heavenly Father already knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. Now, uh, last week, Renee gave us some homework and some papers to write on. I was going to do the same thing tonight, but I'm just going to send you with some to-go homework, okay? And those of you that are studying online, you get to online class. But look what comes next. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think uh, about such things. Listen, it's so easy to rattle that off. That's a scripture that's made for a, a board that you'd buy at Home Goods and put it in your house. But do we do that? Do we find something that is true to think about? Or do we think about all the lies that are going on in the world today? And do we have anxiety over what the lies of the enemy are? Do we think about what is noble? Can we find something in our life, not just, oh, well, God, oh, well, the word of God, all that's true and noble, whatever. What personally can we think about in our own personal experience that's going to take our mind off of our discontented circumstances and put it on what is good, what is pure, what is praiseworthy. Do we think about such things? Do we just praise the Lord when we sing our songs? Or do we find things in our life to praise him for? Praise the Lord, I woke up today. Praise the Lord, I'm still walking even though I stubbed my toe at someone's house this week. Praise the Lord, I have a car. Praise the Lord, I'm well fed. Praise the Lord, I need to go on a diet and I'm not starving. Praise the Lord for his goodness. Praise the Lord for a house to live in. Praise the Lord for air conditioning. Thank you, God, for your many blessings. Forget not his benefits. Think about truth. Think about the truth of God's word. Stop listening to what... Uh, to worry about what the lies of the enemy, the lies of this world. But what can we find in our own lives that is admirable? That's something that we can look up to and admire. And I'm talking about our circumstances, our situation. If Paul learned to be content in any, he knew what it was like to be in need, and he knew what it was like to be with plenty, but he found the secret of his contentment, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Do we depend on that strength of Christ every day of our life to give us that contentment, to let us walk in peace and not panic? Peace and not panic. Amen? Let's pray and praise the Lord today. Father, I'm so thankful to you for your goodness your grace, your mercy. God, I pray that you would help us to change our mind from difficult, awkward circumstances and situations in this world and to think about the things that Paul encourages us to think about because it's all true of who you are. You are good. You are merciful. You are righteous. You are lovely. You are admirable. You give good and perfect gifts. And you even are waiting for that day when either the trumpet call of God and those that have been planted in the ground will rise first and we which are alive and remain will be caught up with you. Or when we pass from this life into the new life, Lord, you're ready and willing and you have prepared something for those that love, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. That's the only description we have right now, but we know that it's a glorious place and that we will have that wonderful glorified body. But most importantly, I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. So God, give us that peace. Help us with our anxiety. Help us with our lack of contentment that we would find a way to praise you in the good things that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I serve here the sweeter he grows the
the sweetering.